But uh, we're going to be in, we're going to read, start reading in Judges chapter 2. And um, we're going to, we're going to start reading in Judges 2. Now I'm, I'm going to tell you, I'm using this as a story again, as an illustrative story to make a point about Romans chapter 7. All right. So before we even get into it, I just want you to know that I'm using this. And so every aspect of this story is not going to be perfectly connected to the passage in Romans 7 I'm teaching. But there's a main thought that I want to bring out. So I'll try to make sure I focus on that one main thought in all of this. Now, in case you, in case you don't know, the time frame of the judges, just to kind of remind you, because, you know, I like to do a little Sunday school class in our Sunday morning services because we don't really have... Sunday school like we used to have in the old church and a lot of times that's whenever people would really learn the Bible all right so the time frame of the judges what I want you to know about that is is that if you'll remember the story of the Exodus y'all remember Israel's and it were slaves in Egypt in the book of Exodus that's the second book in the Bible they were slaves in Egypt um, it's a long story how they got there but finally whenever the Lord called Moses he said he said listen tell Pharaoh to let my people go and, and ultimately, Pharaoh didn't want to let God's people go. Well, can I tell you that when you give you desire to give your heart to the Lord, you know, after all the years that somebody's been speaking to you about Jesus, when the enemy knows that you're getting on the verge of giving your life, the enemy tries to hold on even more. He doesn't want you out of prison walls. He doesn't want you to be able to have the chains broken in your life. He doesn't want you to give your heart over to the Lord. He wants to hold on to you. And that's what happened in the story of the Exodus. And Pharaoh re refused to let God's people go. Well, God knows how to, how to make Pharaoh let go, my friend. And, and he did it, right? He did it through a Passover lamb. That's where Passover comes from. The Israelites killed a lamb that night. They collected blood and they painted it on the doorpost outside the house on the top of the doorpost and the sides. And they got inside and they ate that lamb. That's a perfect type of Jesus. The sacrifice of Jesus. The blood of Jesus. God said, when I see the blood, he said, I'm sending the death angel through the lamb. He was bringing judgment on the world. Egypt is the world. He said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. I will spare you. See, that's what makes Christians true Christians. And how you, when you say true Christian is a true Christian, according to the word of God, is one that believes in their heart, not in their head. You can believe intellectually that Jesus died on the cross and it won't save you. No, believe in your inner man that Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead. Amen. You ask him into your heart. You ask forgiveness of your sin. Amen. And you confess it with your mouth. Believe it in your heart. Confess it with your mouth. And guess what? You become a new creation in Christ. And that's what happened on that Passover night way back in ancient Israel. It's a type of what Jesus does in our life. But the children of Israel wandered in a wilderness experience, right? Once they get into the land, then, then at some point in time, they're in the time frame of the judges. In the time frame of the judges, the children of Israel are already starting to rebel. They're already rebelling against God. Okay, repeatedly rebelling against God. That's just one of the first steps towards that. Just like many times New Testament Christians in our own lives, we fail the Lord. God is gracious and merciful. I got to tell you that if you're here this morning and you feel like you failed the Lord, guess what? All Christians fail the Lord. And I'm not trying to act like it's okay, my friend, because it's not. God doesn't want us to keep failing the Lord. He doesn't want us to be in prison walls. He wants us to be set free and put in liberty. <laughs> but I got to tell you that the enemy wants to take all those things in your life where you haven't done it right. And he wants to condemn you with it. And he wants to weigh you down with it. Well, during the time frame of the judges, the Lord starts to speak to them. And this is the chapter because they're, they're choosing to follow after their own ways. And because of it, they're losing strength. And I think that's really the main, one of the main things I want you to get out of this passage. Is that whenever we go... Try to follow God in a way that's not right. We begin to lose our strength. That's it. The Lord's not fighting for us anymore. And I'm going to transition that into Romans 7. <clears throat> but I want you to understand that as we read. All right. So you ready? Let's read this. Judges chapter 2 starting in verse 1. And an angel of the Lord. Look, sometimes that word angel can be described as a, the main concept of this angel right here is that it was a messenger. Gave a message to the children of Israel. And the angel of the Lord came up. From Gilgal to Bochum, it said, I made you to go up out of Egypt. 
and have brought you into the land which I swear unto your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. I want you to get that word covenant in your heart this morning. Amen. It's a big concept of what I want to talk to you about. Covenant. You know, at its most basic thought, a covenant is an agreement. When we're talking about God, God made an agreement with man. Man was born in sin through Adam and God made an agreement that he would give us the new man, Christ Jesus, so that we could enter into covenant through faith and have an agreement with God. Look what God says. I will never break my covenant with you. God never breaks covenant, my friend. Unfortunately, we can't say that for man. He says, and you shall make no league with the inhabitants of this land. I, can, I need to really be careful that I don't preach every verse. But can I tell you that that's why the scripture says in the New Testament, for you not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. You're not supposed to marry someone who doesn't believe like you. You're not supposed to be close, intimate friends and fellowship with someone that doesn't believe like you. It's going to be hard if you go into business with someone that doesn't believe like you. You're not supposed to be interconnected in a close woven way with people of the world. Why? Because they will affect you. Their mindsets will affect you. The things that their actions will affect you. Their constant speaking will affect you. Yes, yes. <clears throat> How do you know? Because it did it a lot. If you know the story of what? Let's not even go there. Let's just keep going. <laughs> you shall make no league with the inhabitants of this land. You shall throw down their altars. You can't worship their gods. You can't enter into their religious practices, but you have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? Wherefore, I also said, I will not drive them out from before you. If you're not going to follow after me, then I'm not going to drive your enemies out for you. Isn't it? God, you know, listen, I mean, it's not really like proper, but I watched a movie one time and he says, I work on a points-based system, son. And so far, you ain't built up no points. <laughs> Fortunately, I'm actually preaching against works this morning. That true faith in God is not built upon a works-based performance system. Amen. However, Amen. God is asking us to trust him and to believe in, in, through faith in him and to be walk in covenant with him. And when we do what he's asking us to do, he moves by the power of the Holy Spirit. When we, through faith, trust God the way he's asking us to, and he's asking us this in a specific way, then he begins to move. But when we don't, he doesn't move when it comes to those spiritual enemies in our life. Okay? He says, I will not drive them out from before you or from you, but they shall be as thorns in your sides and their gods shall be a snare or a trap unto you. And it came to pass when the angel of the Lord spoke these words unto all the children of Israel that the people lifted up their voice and they wept. Praise God. At least they were at a place where they could still be convicted by God. And they called the name of that place Bochum. And they said, and that means great weeping. And they sacrificed there unto the Lord. And when Joshua had let the people go, the children of Israel went every man unto his inheritance to possess the land. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord that he did for Israel. You know, real quick, I just want to make a point that there's not a lot of people in this church, but there are some people in this church that experienced the way that church used to do, be done. All right, now, I'm not going to sit here and pretend that the way church used to be done was always right, but I want to make a point. The way the church was when I got saved, I was 19, I'm 54. How long ago was that? I don't know. It was in the 80s, late 80s. It was different. When you walked into a church, it was different. There was a reverence for the presence of God. There was an understanding that the word of God was the word of God. There was an understanding that the word of God said that something wasn't right, that the people of God paid attention to it. And even though they realized that maybe they weren't always doing everything right, they didn't pretend like it was okay. At least not in their own heart. They knew something wasn't right because why? The word of the Lord said it. Now, in the digital world that we live in, all you got to do is scroll through Facebook. I mean, that's up to you if you live there. I, I, tried to, I tried to exit that digital world. 
it robs me of my peace. But you can scroll <laughs> through the digital world of Facebook and you can see that people's mindsets in the church is not the same as it used to be. That's is right. it okay to just preach the truth? I'm not going to say anything to you this morning. Yes, it's my opinion, but it's an opinion that's based upon the word of God. I'm not going to say anything to you this morning that is not in some way, shape, or form formulated from the word, from the word of God. And one of the things that I want to say is, is that you can scroll through Facebook. And you can see all the stuff about the new influence of this. Of the, well, let me just call it what it is. The spirit of homosexuality. Oh, you're such a bigot. No, 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 no. You're missing the point. I love homosexuals. Right, right. Just like I love people that have a problem with internet pornography, like I used to. Right, right. I love the drug addict. I love the alcoholic. But what I'm here to tell you is the word of God is very clear. Right. Sin is sin. Preach it. The world, the spirit of the world and secularism is trying to convince the whole world that this is normal behavior. That the, that the word of God is antiquated and outdated. And that there's a new season on the horizon. And I'm here to tell you that that's lies. That's right. The word of God is truth. Let God be true and every man be made a liar. Yes, yes. That's what the word of God says. That's it. So when you scroll through Facebook or, or if you, Lord help you, Lord help me. Allow the world to begin to influence our mindsets. And we start to buy into the concept of, yeah. well, everybody should be. Deserves to be able to love. God, you know what? No, you, yeah, you deserve to be able to love the one who created you. <laughs> Let me not get off on that too much. That's just one example of what the spirit of the world is doing in society today. You understand what I'm saying? I could go on about gender. I could go on. They even turn race into something that it shouldn't be. That's it. It, come on. And, and we're, we're sitting back and we're being influenced by all these opinions that are based upon things that, that are just really for no other purpose other than to cause strife and their lies by the enemy to cause a bunch of confusion. And let me tell you something. It's going to get harder and harder as times go by for the people of God to take a stand. The people that are truly trying to follow the word of the Lord. And the point that I was trying to make is that back in the 80s when I got saved, there was no confusion about that. That's right. Everybody knew. Everybody knew that the word of God was true and that man was a liar. And now the church itself is confused. Yeah, that's right. Because the man behind the pulpit is scared to speak the truth. I'm not going to sit here and pretend to you that I'm some brave dude. No, no, no. I can't only help myself half the time. I didn't even plan on saying none of this. It's not in my notes. But what I will tell you is this. Is that I desire to yield my tongue to the Lord. That's right. I desire to speak what I believe that he wants me to speak. The children of Israel during the time frame of the judges did not obey the voice of the Lord. They did not make leagues with the world around them. No, I'm sorry. They did make a league. They did make a connection to the world around them. And the world around them began to influence them. And they allowed, if I can say it like that, the world to come into the church. Right, right. The false gods of their world, they brought it into their church. The influence of those false religions... They brought it into their church. And the Lord said, if that's what you choose to do, I'm not going to run them off for you. I'm not going to get rid of your enemies. I'm going to let them stand. They will be thorns in your side. Mm. Sometimes we're in the church and we don't understand. Oh, man, this thing's like a thorn in my side. It won't go away. Even Paul had a thorn in his side. Paul said it. I prayed three times that the Lord would remove this thorn in my flesh. And the Lord kept saying, no, 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 no. Not going to remove it. My grace is sufficient for you. For in your weakness, my strength is made perfect. Sometimes the Lord allows a thorn to stay in your flesh. He said, had the Lord not given me this thorn, I would have been elevated from the many revelations. You know what he's saying? He's saying, the Lord done show me so much that if this thorn wasn't right here in my flesh, a constant reminder of something that's frustrating me that I just want the Lord to take away. If he wouldn't have left that there, I'd have been so puffed up in pride, thinking I was all that and, well, and I know they don't say this anymore, but and a bag of chips. I would have thought I was all that. But no, this thorn that just stuck right here yeah. in my flesh, it reminds me, no, you ain't all that, Paul. Thank you, Jesus. You're not all that. 
The Lord's allowing the people of Israel at this point in time to understand, I'm going to leave that there as a thorn in your flesh because you did not do it the way that I asked you to do it. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died being 110 years old. And they buried him in the border of his inheritance in Timnatharis, in the mount of Ephraim, on the north side of the hill of Gaash. And also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers. Look at this. And there arose another generation after them. This is not really what I plan on preaching, but whenever I read over the text multiple times and I see these things, I got to bring it out. All this context that I just said is apropos or relevant for this right here. What are you trying to say? The church and the way it was done back in the 80s, it's so different than today. Listen, I was licensed with the Assemblies of God. I'm talking to you now about something that I experienced firsthand. If you're with the Assemblies of God, I'm not picking on you. I'm not picking on preachers in the Assemblies of God. I'm just stating the facts, man. There's a movement that's been going on in these Protestant churches with this whole seeker-sensitive movement thing, such as we're going to build youth groups by being relevant to young people. The, the wording that was used was this guy, we're going to hire this dude as a youth pastor because why? Because he's a kid magnet. Meaning this dude's so cool that the kids are just going to flock to him. And then now we got this charismatic leader that's got a room full of people and they can just talk about whatever it is that they want to talk about. They're not giving them the gospel because if you give people the straight up gospel many times, listen to me, most of the people sitting in this room today, most of the people tuning in on video are only tuning in and coming because they actually want to try to hear what they believe to be the truth. Right, right. You start giving people a good dose of the truth after a period of time and they don't really want it, guess what? They're going to get uncomfortable. This ain't cool. This ain't fun. This ain't relevant. No, what, what much of the world today and the influence that it's had on the church wants is a social guy. Something cool. Next thing you know, I watched it with my own eyes, dude. They dim the lights. They put the fluorescent lights on. And then you walk in there and it's like boom, boom, boom. Boom, boom, boom. And they got this crowd up there. And they're kind of moving before the service starts. Boom, boom, boom. Boom, boom, boom. And I go in and I tell the guy, I'm like, dude, what are you doing? You're preparing these young people for the club more than you are the church. What are you talking about? Everybody's doing it. I'm like, dude, have you ever heard the scripture, a little leaven in your lump? The false leaven. What's leaven? Oh, yeah. I forgot. You read the message Bible. Oh, my bad. I know. Isn't that rude? Yeah. But it is the truth. It's the truth. Sometimes the truth hurts. Oh, you read that. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeast. It's yeast. What does yeast do? It spreads. A little pinch of yeast in the dough spreads and it changes the nature of it. Wow. Does it not? It produces, the organism produces carbon dioxide and causes it to get all big and bloated. Oh, that's a good analogy. I never thought about that before. Just because uh -huh. the church is big and bloated, come on, doesn't mean it's healthy. Uh -huh. <laughs> you want unleavened bread, spiritually speaking, because that's a type of Jesus and without sin. Yeah. Amen. Anyway, I'm like, dude, you're preparing these kids for the world, for the club. Dude, I don't even know if it's true because I wasn't there anymore. I had exited stage left. But let me just say this. I heard that a little bit later, they actually started stamping their hands when they were walking in. Wow. Got a little fluorescent light. Let's stamp your hand and come on in and say, what in the world are we doing? What is this? And they can't see. It's literally a, it's a spirit of witchcraft. Let's call it what it is. Galatians. Who has bewitched you? You've been put under a spell. It's a spiritual harlot. And they all did. And his point was, who do you think, I don't know what he's thinking. You little chunky fat mat from South Louisiana. Who do you think you are? And the whole denomination is doing this. The whole nation is doing this. And here you stand before me. Nobody even wants to come to your Bible study. And you're going to tell me. See what I'm trying to say? That's what was going on here. And look what it said. And there arose another generation after them which knew not the Lord. Oh, what I'm trying to tell you is this. Church has changed, my friend. And my question, this is just one question real quick in the introductory phase of this message. My question is, is our people even really in the faith? I'm not, I'm not the judge of each church. That's not even what I'm here to do. But I am here to tell you to challenge 
And, and if, you, if you hurry up and you turn me off, then you don't want to allow your mind to be challenged. My question is, is if the gospel has slowly been changed and the relevant factor that we want people to come to church so we dilute the gospel, if it has slowly been changed, kind of like the frog in the pot kind of thing, over the many years, and now we've ended up in a particular spot where we are right now, is it even the gospel anymore? Are we even in the faith anymore? Is it the covenant that God cut with mankind when he sent Jesus on the earth that Paul wrote about? It's just a question. It's a question for people to, to imagine in their heart and mind. And you'll never know unless you read the word of God, study the word of God, and find a teacher or a preacher that will tell you about the truth of the word of God. They knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel and the children of Israel that's another thing. I mean, they just, I don't know, I said it last week, and I'm not trying to fuss, but they, when it doesn't work, when the gospel doesn't work, they add Christian counselors. And they amalgamate or they mix together counseling, which is basically built off of psychology, and they make a mixture of psychology and theology. And they're mad now. I mean, they're probably not really anybody watching on the video, but I'm just saying, if they were, they'd be, they'd be pulling their hair out. Who's they? Those people that believe that way. Because they're trying to build a system and they're trying to meet the needs, the felt needs of the people. That's what, that, that's their big thing. That's their impetus. That's what drives them. Felt needs. The people have, the people feel like they have needs. The people feel like they have needs and therefore we must make their, our message relevant to meet the needs that they feel like they have. And, and so therefore we will tailor our message to meet those felt needs and they will be happy and they will show up. And you know what the Lord said, but what about what I feel, man? What about what I feel? What about my felt needs? <laughs> what I have for my people with my word? The people forget they're not even really serving the Lord anymore. They did evil in the sight of the Lord. They served Balaam. They forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt. You know, one thing that Robert used to say, man, a few words, but sometimes the simplicity of what he says always would drive a point home. He used to say there's a spirit behind every false doctrine. Or there's a spirit behind every doctrine. You might have got that from Brother Swagger, I think. But the point is there's a spirit behind every doctrine. Doctrine is teaching. So that means if it's not the teaching that is in the word. Listen to me. This is, this is just, this ought to make sense. If it's not the teaching that lines up with the word of God, then it's not the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense what I'm trying to say? What you're trying to say, my preacher's demon possessed. That's not what I'm trying to say. But what I'm trying to say is, is that if he's preaching a gospel that is contrary to the word of God, then he's under the influence of a spirit that is not the Holy Spirit, period. Because he's not preaching the truth. He, he probably doesn't know it. I had a Bible professor at Southwestern Assembly of God University, my favorite Bible professor. Everybody else ran from him, I ran to him. And he made one of the comments he made was this. It doesn't matter whether pre people preach the gospel in error on purpose or accident. The result is the same. It leads to bondage instead of freedom. That's right. It doesn't matter whether they're doing it on accident. It's still not going to be able to liberate people. All right. <laughs> they followed other gods of the gods of the people that were around about them and bowed themselves unto them and provoked the Lord to anger. And they forsook the Lord and served Baal and Ashtoreth. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel and he delivered them into the hands of spoilers that spoiled them. Let me ask you a question. Do you believe that God is merciful enough to allow you and I to find ourselves in the midst of a situation where we don't feel like we're ever getting truly free because of the fact that we've been connected to a false gospel and he's wanting to get ultimately get our attention and cause us to cry out. Sometimes it takes you eight years to get there, ten years, sometimes even longer. But do you realize that if God would bless your life while you were in the midst of false doctrine, that you would go on perpetually believing that you would. And I'm not even going to try to sit here and pretend that people don't get seasons of blessing in their life when they're in the false doctrine. Right, right. But God's a good God. He's merciful. He's kind, he's gracious, he's holy, he's true, and he loves his word, and he wants his people called by his name that are genuine to, to come to the truth. Amen? So God sold them into the hands of their enemies. This is really what I wanted you to see out of this context of this message. 
or this story, so that they could not any longer stand before their enemy. Look at this. So that they could not any longer stand before their enemy. They broke covenant with God. They started believing a false way. The result is that God allowed them to be brought under the power of their enemies. They were not given the strength they needed from God to have victory over their enemies. That's the main point that I want you to know. You and I need strength from God to have victory over our, and we can say plural enemies, but it's really the enemy, right? Because even though we walk, may walk in Walmart and somebody may say, I'm just saying, like, somebody may say, oh, you got a church. And I'm not trying to pick, so please don't get offended. You got a church that's full of ex-drug addicts. I mean, that's all you got up in that church is, is ex-drug addicts. Well, the comment that that person just made is tailored to try to hurt my feelings in some way, right? I'm just saying. That's what, his, that's what that person's purpose was. What's to hurt my feelings? But the, really the response should be, Hallelujah! <laughs> They're not still drug addicts. No, 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 no. That's not what the Word of God says. The Word of God says they're new creations in Christ Jesus. The Lord's a deliverer. He has set the captives free. And He'll set you free from whatever your bondage is, sir. You self-righteous. Anyway, the point that I'm trying to make is, is that... What is my point? <laughs> my point is, is that that's an enemy, but that's the, but the enemy is using him as an enemy. So whatever your situation is, that's just one little scenario. You're walking through life and you got all kinds of people trying to beat you up. People trying to beat you up at work. People trying to meet you at Walmart. They trying to meet you at the gym. The enemy's trying to use them to, to inflame you, to frustrate you, to aggravate you, right? The enemy wants to get you off track. And all I'm trying to say is, is that we need the strength of the Lord to give us victory over our enemy slash enemies so that we can walk in victory. So that why? So you can be a witness for the Lord. Not to just fix all your felt needs. He'll do that too. If you'll seek you first the kingdom of God, his righteousness. Amen. They broke covenant with God. They started believing a false way. As time went by, the, the next generations, they didn't even know God anymore. It became more common for people to not serve God than they were actually serving God. And with this thought in mind that Israel broke covenant and came under the power of their enemies, let's look at the new covenant. Let's look at a couple of scriptures of the new covenant. Let's take a look at Luke chapter 22. This is a teaching. I hope you can bear with me here. Luke chapter 22. Look at this. This is Jesus' words. Likewise, also, the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the New Testament. In my blood, which is shed for you. Look, sometimes I like the way uh, the NASB says it. Sometimes I don't like the way. As a matter of fact, I'll show you a, a spot I don't like what the NASB says when we get to Romans 7. But this is, look at, I like, do you know why I like this? Because of one word. And in the same way, he took the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant. I like that word covenant. Because that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about the new covenant. A testament speaks of the covenant. This word here, this cup is the covenant. This bread is the covenant. What are you talking about? The new covenant. Can I get that through enough? The new covenant. What is the new covenant, preacher? It's Jesus. It's Jesus Christ, the sinless one, the unleavened bread of the new covenant when they were taking the first their last Passover and first communion. Amen. That's what they were doing on the Passover right before Jesus is crucified. This bread is my body and it is broken for you. And this cup, which represents my blood, is the blood of the new covenant. And it will be shed for you. So what are you trying to say, preacher? Just what I just said. That the new covenant is Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's right. The finished work of Jesus. It's always God's plan. Well, well, how do you know it was always God's plan? Well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Let's go ahead and change this over back to the King James. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 36. I know many of you are familiar with this passage of scripture. Ezekiel 36, 25. So now we're talking about 500 years before Jesus. They've already been in all this disobedience. It just continued on. This is many years after the judge's story, but they continued in disobedience and God's promising that he's going to give them a new covenant <coughs> in the Old Testament, 500 years before Jesus, okay? 
Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you. That may not bother you, but it always bothered me because I'm like, well, if the message is about the cross, about the sacrifice of Jesus, why does it say water? Because some preacher is going to take that and try to teach that as baptism. Well, you know, you just got to dig. It took me three years to figure it out, but finally I did. I was talking to somebody. We were talking about the ashes of the red heifer. I know you've already heard me say that. The ashes of the red heifer was a whole different thing. What is that? It was a red cow, and they, they, they killed it different. I'm not trying to be gruesome, but they hit it in the head with a sledgehammer, is my understanding. They didn't cut its throat. Why? They left the blood in it. They burnt the whole thing, blood and all. All the other ones, the blood was poured out. This one had the blood in it. So the blood are in the ashes. And then they take the ashes that have blood in it and they make a tincture. It's the old pharmacist word. They take a little pinch. And they put it and they stir it up and then they sprinkle it. See, the word of God says in the book of Hebrews that almost all things in the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, were sprinkled with blood. Because Moses sprinkled the whole tabernacle and all the articles. How they will sprinkle with blood? Because there's blood in the ashes of the red heifer. I will sprinkle you clean water upon you. And you shall be clean from all your filthiness. Listen, you're going to be clean through the blood of the lamb. And from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart. Listen, that's new covenant theology. Don't you know that when you got saved, he gave you a new heart. A new inner man. And I will give you a new spirit. And I will put... Within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. And look at this. And I will give you a heart of flesh. This is the point. And I will put my spirit within you. That's new covenant. A new covenant promise that when after he, he didn't say Jesus' name because they're not ready yet. They don't understand. But once Jesus comes, now you and I, Jesus dies on the cross. He sheds his blood. And now you and I put our faith in that. Guess what he does? He gives us a new heart. He renews our spirit and he puts his spirit on the inside of us. I'm just trying to show you that God has had the same plan. Look, here's another one. Jeremiah 31, 31. Jeremiah 31. Actually, yeah, starting in verse 31. Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they broke, although I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts. How do you put the law in somebody's inward parts, Lord? By putting my spirit in. My spirit that wrote with my finger upon them tablets of stone in the Old Testament. Now it's written on the inside of their hearts because my spirit lives on the inside of them. It's a new covenant. God promised it 500 years before Jesus ever shows up. And I say this all the time. He's not changing his mind, church. He's not going to change his mind for a relevant church. He's not going to change his mind. No, 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 no. He's not changing his mind. His word is set. Amen. Israel of old worshipped the false religion and idols of the gods of the world around them. They broke their covenant with God. When God gave Jesus as the new covenant, which he always promised, and they rejected it. I got a question for you. This is a question. We're thinking together. We're working together. When they rejected God's new covenant, does that make Israel today no different than Israel of old, finding themselves caught up in the works of false religion? I'm asking you a question. Because see, many times people believe that we should include some of what the Jews do today in our form of worship. We should keep a Passover. We should get a prayer shawl, cover our head. We should do all of these kinds. I'm here to tell you that Israel that has rejected Jesus is not serving the God of their fathers. Because there was a transition that God had promised that there was a new covenant coming. No, they've rejected the new covenant. It's not the same. They are no different at this point in time. If they are not born again believers, they are no different than the Gentile nations. They are no different than the false gods that are out there because they're serving a false way. I believe that. Yeah. And people send their, anyway. Let me ask you another question. When Catholics pray through Mary or the saints instead of Jesus, while I'm saying that, let me try to hustle up. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 3. Uh, I'm sorry, 1 Timothy chapter 2. 
before you get mad at me. Uh, <laughs> First Timothy chapter two and verse five. Before you get mad at me. When Catholics pray through Mary or saints instead of Jesus, for there is one God and one mediator go between between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. When Catholics right. pray through someone other than Mary, or when they pray through Mary or the saints instead of Jesus, when they pray the beads of the rosary, Matthew chapter 6, let me let you see it. Don't get weary on me. Don't fall asleep. Try to stay awake. Get, we're going to start serving coffee. But when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think they shall be heard for their much speaking. I just went ahead and did this this morning. You might not be able to see it. What is a mala and why does it have 108 beads? The mala necklace, an extra long beaded accessory, has the look and feel of exotic beach vibes in yogi surfer style. And he goes on to say these beads have been around forever, man. 1500, 2000 BC, they used in the Hindu religion, they're used in the Buddhist religion, they're used in the Babylonian religion for vain repetition. You press the bead, you pray a prayer, you pray, press the next bead, you pray a prayer, you go through the whole thing. What? I'm just trying to be real with you, my friend. I'm just trying to tell the truth. When Catholics pray through Mary or the saints instead of Jesus, when they pray the beads of the rosary, so when they worship God that way, is that breaking covenant with God? I'm asking you. I'm asking you, ma'am, sir. I'm asking anybody in this place. Is it according to the word of the Lord? And when Protestants that believe like us, you thought you were off the hook. <laughs> when Protestants that believe like us who agree that our faith is in Jesus for salvation. And when we struggle, we start looking to other things to give us peace. Whether they be our friends. A counselor. Oh, here he goes. Dude, go to your counselor until the Lord gives you the revelation. Don't you start blaming stuff on me, buddy. I'm just trying to make a point. Counselors, they go to alcohol, a new relationship, but specifically our own religious works. When we start looking to our own religious works to, that, that we think is going to make us right with God, how much we read, how much we go to church, how many ministries we're involved in, does that cause us to operate outside of covenant? And in all these cases, does this cause them, cause us to end up in a place, here we now, where we are unable to have victory over our enemies? Yes. If we're outside of covenant, if we're not walking in the covenant the way the Lord would have us to walk in, that is the introduction context for the next six verses that I'm about to teach in Romans 7. You ready? Romans 7. Now, we introduced last week that Romans 7 is a is teaching us that th that not only did we die according to Romans 6, we died to the power of sin in Romans 6. And in Romans 7, the Bible teaches us that we died to the power of law or the dominion of law over our lives. Meaning, God gave the world his law whether they recognize it or not. And if you don't keep the law in all points, you're guilty. And... Many times, and the law is built on performance. When you don't do it right, you're guilty. God gave us that part, part of the reason God gave us that was to prove to us that we needed Jesus. He gave that to Jesus to prove to them that they needed Jesus. Okay, but yet still, even in modern day Christianity, much of our much of our daily lives are built upon us trying to perform for God. And in a certain sense, it's a type of law. It's a type of works-based religion. Okay, let me try to break it down for you because sometimes I think it causes a mental block. When I first got saved, and I've shared this before in the past, but I haven't shared it in a while. The preacher that I was under meant well. We made a comment one time. You ought not see PG-13. I'm just telling you, it was a fence law. We created a law. You shall not cross this boundary. You understand what I'm saying? You, ought to not, you, you, you go to see a PG-13 movie and they see you in that movie house. If the rapture takes place, you're going to miss, brother. That's what they say. Well, you know what? I'm going to be honest with you. That preacher was probably right. If we wasn't so hardened by Netflix and the world out there, we probably would agree that the Holy Spirit would be speaking more clearly. And he'd say... Why in the world are you polluting your spirit with that garbage? I'm just being real with you. Yeah. 
I'm, because I'm trying to take the other angle. But at the same time, when I try to create a law, I shall not go see PG-13, invariably in my heart and in my mind, I'm like, hmm. Mike Landry just thought he was going to go to the North Pole. But he goes and sees PG-13. And I never crossed the line beyond PG-13. Christopher Lusto thinks that he's close with the Lord, but I watch him out the corner of my eye, and he only lifts one hand, whereas I lift both. Is it okay if I do that? I hope so. I'm trying to make a point. Because listen, the heart of man, according to Jeremiah, is deceitfully wicked, and who can know it? We'll start thinking we're so holy and righteous in our own hearts and minds, and we'll start picking everybody else to be recognized. Does he not? He does. There's, and it's in you too, my friend. I hope you're okay with that. It's in us all. Lord help us. Amen. So that's part of that performance-based. It says, for when we were in the flesh, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Because Paul knew that people were going to question him on that. And so he had, God forbid it. The law is not sin. And he says it later. He says, I'm the problem, not the law. But God purposely put it in there so that we would understand that we couldn't do it in our own strength and that we needed to God. Look what he says. No, I would not have known sin but by the law. For I had not known lust except the law that said, you shall not covet. You know, that's what basically coveting and lusting is the same thing. It's like you're wanting something that doesn't belong to you. Right? But sin, I want you to see this word. Sin. Sin taking occasion by the commandment wrought or produced in me all manner, that big old fancy word right there means all kinds of lust. For without the law, sin was dead. All right, we're going to go back to it, but look at this. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived. I was alive, I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin became alive and I died. That the difference right there is the word revive. I, I, I read the book of Revelation in the first two and a half weeks on that book, on that boat. And then, then the next thing you know, it still started slowly creeping up because of what they was teaching. Well, whenever you find yourself in a struggle, you just need, when you're in that pipe yard and lust tries to enter your mind, you just start praying in tongues, brother. So now without realizing, am I, am I telling you not to pray in tongues? No, we're Pentecostal. We believe in praying in tongues. The word of God says in the book of Jude, praying in the, in the spirit, building up your most holy faith. Okay? But this is the problem. If you start putting your faith in praying in tongues to get victory over sin, now you've changed the object of your faith from Jesus Christ and what he did for you on the cross. And now you're putting your faith in praying in tongues. I hope that makes sense. Yeah. That's a problem. That's a system of law and performance. That's you Look, whether you realize it or not, putting faith in something that you do instead of something that Jesus did. Yeah. Okay. Oh, you brother, you need to be in church every time services. Are, but yeah, I want. Please show up. But that, but you showing up in this church is not what's going to give you victory over That's the right. power of sin in your life. That's right, man. And before you know it, I went back to dipping. And then it starts that whole process I told you about last week, where I started promising the Lord every morning I was going to quit. And the next thing you know, I'm out there in places I ain't got no business being, knowing that they got girls hanging out there. And the next thing you know, I'm drinking a little bit. But the whole time, thank God, the Lord's convicted. And but yet, 12 years of going back and forth between that kind of silly thing, without until I understood the message of the finished work of Jesus. I was living in the midst of a system of faith in these laws that I had created for myself, whether it's the Mosaic law or a law that you create for yourself, it produces the same thing. It produces you trying to get victory over sin in your own strength, rather than the Lord giving you the victory. Amen? He says, then the commandment came, and I like the way that they were telling me to do. Yeah. Yeah. 
And so whenever the Apostle Paul is saying this right here, what it, what, again, I'm, I don't know what he added. I don't know what commandment he added to his faith, but this is talking about after he was saved. We know from the history of the book of Acts that the Apostle, and the book of Galatians that the Apostle Paul struggled in the Arabian desert. And Romans 7, he's, re, he's actually recounting that. As we get further in the chapter, we're going to see the narrative part where he says, that, where he describes the fact that he had to struggle. Because, it, I told you, what did I tell y'all last week? The default position of fallen man is that we automatically go to a performance works based yeah. Yeah. faith. Yeah. Right. Just like the computer screen defaults to whatever, you, to whatever it is, our spiritual condition automatically goes to the to works meaning when adam and eve fell they tried to cover their nakedness with fig leaves and and since then now we're trying to perform and the enemy wants to put a middle block in our mind and prevent us from understanding this plus the fact that can i just be real with you i know i'm keeping you long but just love me listen <laughs> did you not know that mankind wants a formula Come on, preacher, I don't want to sit here in no service for an hour and ten minutes and have to hear you say all this technical stuff about the Bible. I just want you to tell me three, is that not what so many messages are today? Three keys to your victory today. Whatever those three keys are. And I'm here to try to tell you that with the hunt, now I'm on my 15,000th word and my 72nd minute, the simplicity of what I'm trying to tell you is, Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. I don't know the rest of it, but it's something like, and the things of life, earth, will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. That's the simplicity of my message this morning. Just turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. If we could just grab a hold of the simplicity of that message. Lord, I'm going through and I'm struggling. But I want to just look to you, the author and the finisher of my faith. Because I know you won the victory because your word says it. I want to trust in you. I want to hold on to you. No matter how deep the valley or no matter how dark the night, I want to hold on to you, oh Lord. And I don't want to trust in my own self anymore. I want to trust in you, Lord. But when the commandment came, what did he add? I don't know. I shall not walk near the sepulcher because then I'd be unclean for seven days and that's going to make me more holy than Jesus did. He's adding, he added something to his faith. And when the commandment came, sin revived. Sin was dead for a moment in time. I didn't dip for two and a half weeks. I didn't want to go to the places where I had went before. Alcohol, yes, I was on a boat, but I didn't want it. And then it started coming back alive. You start adding commandments to your life. I need this and Jesus. Listen, I talked to a dude one time, and I know I need to hustle up, but I talked to a guy one time in another church, and I preached this. This is all I preach, right? Okay. He came up to me at the other church. He said, let me tell you something, man. I appreciate you, but I need Jesus and AA. Ooh. I said, well, let me tell you something, boss. You go on and you believe that. And you guess what? You ain't done. I told him, you will take another lap around the world. Just like a jogger on a track, my friend, you will take another lap around the world. You won't confront me, I'm going to confront you back. Four months later, he called me with tears. I got another DUI. I don't remember. I hope I responded properly because there's a proper way to respond to that. I, sh I don't think I would have told him, I told you so. I sure hope not because that would have been flesh. That would have been horrible. My point is, is that no, 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 no. God's not going to bless that. There's sometimes people end up in AA and they're really seeking for truth and God somehow, of course. <laughs> Can I just be real again? God used a donkey, man. <laughs> he 
and Danielle says it all the time, a broken clock is right twice in a 24-hour period. God used a donkey to speak to the false prophet Balaam. He's like, where are you going? I told you not to do this, but you're doing it anyway. That's what they, if I'm not mistaken, I could be wrong. Well, I'm not going to say it because it's going to sound like I'm cussing. Because, you know, the King James uses the word as for donkey. Because that's a jacket. And, and, and there's pretty sure there's a scripture in the Bible where it says that the Lord used the dumbass to speak. Because <laughs> meaning dumb because because the word the King James word dumb means you're mute and you can't speak. And it, and a donkey ain't supposed to be able to speak. <laughs> All right, but God used the dumbass to speak to the prophet. I'm just telling you, that's what the Bible says. God can use a donkey, man. All right. The commandment came, sin revived, and I died. All right, now I'm going to close with this. You ready? This word occasion right here. <coughs> I think that this is very interesting because this word occasion, look what it says. A place from which a movement or attack is made. Get that in your brain for a second. A place from which a movement or attack is made. A base of operation. So I could be wrong. I don't remember one time I said this and Sean Pereira was here and he corrected me because he was in Kuwait or Desert Storm or whatever. But when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, if I'm not mistaken, we use Saudi Arabia. But I don't know. Sean, if I'm wrong and you're watching, just shoot me a text tomorrow and I'll give tips to the comments. Some country in the Middle East, America used as a base of operations from which they flew their sorties. These little missions that they went and they bombed. What I'm trying to tell you is, is that the analogy here is that law, sin uses law as a occasion or a base of operation. You and I are not supposed to be continuing to live according to law. You and I are not supposed to be continuing to live for righteousness according to a set of rules and regulations. I shall not go to PG-13 and think you're more holy. No, you and I are supposed to understand that Jesus is our righteousness. And that without him we're hopeless. And that we're dependent upon him. And that we will keep our faith in him. And that if we continue to believe in this finished work. And the fact that he shed his blood. That grace will flow into our lives. But when we add the commandment, when we add the rule and the regulation, sin uses the law as a base of operations to fly a sortie into our spiritual life, to fly a mission and to bombard us into our spiritual life, to wreak havoc into our spiritual life. And can I tell you this last little thing? Music, musicians, you can come because we always need to finish our service with a worship song to the Lord. Can I, can I tell you this last little thing right here? God allows it. You understand that? Just like he allowed in the book of Judges that we read earlier. And he did not remove the enemies from them. And they did not have strength over their enemies. God allows this thing to happen in our lives. To where we don't get victory over our enemies because God wants us to come to the place where we realize our faith needs to remain in the simple message of keeping our eyes on Jesus. Amen. Let's worship the Lord as we close. Amen.